I'm evaluating the situation here at Panorama Overlook. Perhaps I could launch and land a motor there sometime because the, the site over here is tight. Oh, somebody's texting. Guys, the sun just popped out. I've been driving for four hours. I've been on the road on my way up here. They were showing that the sky would show a patch of sun sign. Sun, 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 sunshine. Come on, Cal, find your words, dude. Find your words, sunshine. And I was totally like, would not have bet on that. Looking at the sky on the way up here, completely blanketed, overcast. I saw no holes, no rays of sunlight, and no hope. And here I am about half a mile from launch and boom, the sun just blasted the side of the mountain. So there's possible lift, there's clouds, uh, base is pretty low. I won't be going far today. And buzzards are soaring. It's light. It's real light. But they're staying up, and it's not turbulent. Sorry, I get I get distracted. It looks like it may have been worth the drive. At the very least, I was gonna see my friends and not shake hands with them. But the sun's shining. I see blue skies. Oh my gosh! This is exciting times. This is exciting times. Roadrunner activity is high today. Gates open, my friends. Let's go see who's here. This is one of my favorite places. I did probably 18 out of my first 20 mountain launches at this location. Who wants to be on the internet? I mean, who wants to be at Cloud Base? Nobody told me it was Puffy Jacket Day. What the heck? Uh, you crest, you crest, you want crest, no man? wonder they don't want to be seen. Golly. Hey, I've heard of a sucker hole. Is this a glory hole when you get the only sun in the area? I don't think that's what a glory hole is, but nobody got it. <laughs> So thanks to Mr. Woody Hayes for showing me these smoke bombs, I decided to bring one to the mountain, pluck it and chuck it, and then watch and see if I could learn anything about the thermals as they were developing off the side of this hill. And you can certainly see them. Now what we're seeing initially is just kind of the wind blowing the thermal. I mean, there's not many thermals right here, but if you look, you'll start to notice the little fingers kind of sticking up out of this trail of smoke. And it gets more and more as we go. I threw it at kind of the end of a cycle before another one really cranked up. I wanted to just sort of watch it propagate. You see those little fingers right there? Those are your little feeder thermals that actually coalesce into your bigger, more defined thermals that we get into in just a little while. I end up flying around, but I just wanted to see what it looked like from a like a smoke bomb perspective. And they don't last very long. But yeah, look at this, how much bigger that little feeder is. And there's another little one coming up. And... You can see they're going up more than they're going across the mountain like it was right when it started. Just thought it was an interesting thing to look at. Wanted to see it. Hope you liked it. You see the thermals whipping up. The air be rising, my friends. So update. I just top landed Panorama. First attempt. My hands got so what I thought was cold. Turns out they're probably just numb from, from holding the toggles and flying. I didn't do any videoing, but I never let go of the toggles once. It was a, a punchy day. It required being on the controls. I, I stopped numerous collapses from happening at the edge of the thermals. They're pretty sharp. Sun is banging. There's stronger days out there, but it was a day where you couldn't let go. The fact that my arms were held high, controlling, I just didn't have good circulation. It was just cold enough that, and I got the wrong gloves. I don't know where my good gloves went. I looked for them and looked for them before I left. No dice. I don't know. That was another thing. My hands got cold enough that I think the vessels constricted in my fingers, and then the gravity did the rest and kept blood from getting in there, and they just went numb. And I was having no problem controlling the glider or flying, but... It hurts so bad when the blood came back to them. They're still tingling. I'm not going to go back up until I can feel my hands again and change gloves, maybe for a different type of glove. I'm going to look in the back, just see if I can find something. There's got to be something in this truck, a piece of tape. I'll wrap my fingers in tape. Both gloves I got, I got two pair, but they're both breathable. That's no good. And it's, I don't know, up a few thousand feet from here. Oh, the Udi quit working again, so I don't know how how how... how much altitude I had. I did several climbs. I went further down Winestair Mountain than I've ever gone. That was nice. I don't know who's still flying. Yeah, there's still some guys flying around. Good times, good times. Good. 
So I'm not going back up, guys. I'm going home. I flew for about an hour and a half, two hours. Let's see, got here about 12, launched about 12.45, and it's 3.30. I just got my gear put up. Yeah, about two hours is what it adds up to. My hands are sore. They're so, they're so cold and numb that they're now sore. It's weird. Never had that on my ears. So interesting stuff going on there. But I got some daylight. I'm gonna book it to the house. Let's do that. I'm gonna cut the video here. Maybe I'll uh I'll film something on the way home. Much love, guys. Kyle out. So since I didn't video the flight, I thought maybe we would do just a little post-flight debrief. So it was a lot colder and a lot stronger. Well, actually, the predictions did show that it was gonna be some strength to it, some punch to it. So I couldn't get real high. And I also tried a new technique. I, there were several pilots in the air, maybe one, two, uh, maybe eight, like eight paragliders and a hang glider. Everybody was kind of congregating around the launch. The uh, base wasn't real high, wasn't high enough to go out the back good. Yet there was enough wind that penetrating and going the upwind task was equally as difficult. You just kind of got to the LZ and that was about as far as I think you could go. I pushed down to the point away from everyone and I went out sort of by myself. I had a good bailout on the road. I used the road as my bailout on the spine of the mountain. Rode some thermals over there all alone and I tried a technique out that you can't really try when there's other pilots around, but going in and out of thermals between uh, lift and sink, I heard it described on the Cloud-Based Mayhem, an excellent podcast. And there's your plug, Gavin. Listen to the Cloud-Based Mayhem excellent podcast for free flight forgive me i forget who was being interviewed but it got talked about something that i've thought about but never actually mentioned or talked or recorded sort of being a leaf in the air it kind of brought me back to one time i was in a parking lot just watching the sky waiting on something a grocery bag a plastic grocery sack blew by me tumbled by me just a few feet from me and it bounced off the ground and then it just kept going up till it went out of sight several thousand feet in the air it just it it took off, rode a thermal, and up and up and away. And I, I got to thinking, you know, that, that, nobody's steering that bag. It's just going with the flow. Apparently, that's the thing you can do with your paraglider, too, is just sort of get nice and balanced on it. When you hit that sink, just sort of pretend you're on a river and go with the flow. You know, there's a saying, go with the flow works real good when you're trying to connect thermals flying. You just sort of balance and you feel which way that glider pulls you as you approach the nearest thermal, you can almost shut your eyes and know it's right there. It's real hard to put into words. It's a feeling though, but you sort of just let the glider go. You still got pressure. You're still making moves on it to prevent little collapses, etc. But but you let it. You don't fight it. You don't try to control it. You sort of let it float along, man, and it and it inevitably will pull you into the core of the next thermal. And when you connect with it, you just do another climb. It's uh, it's good medicine. I've said it before, I'll always say it, I'll always do it. Flying is good medicine, you know. I take a take a dose, a couple hours, I do it so bad I had the worst pain I've ever had in my fingers, and yet I still did it. Was loving it, even through the pain, through the numbness, knowing how brutal it was gonna be when I finally touched down. I couldn't even take my helmet off. There was a, a spectator, Miss Bree, was sitting on the mountain. She saw me top land, oh, oh. Let me finish the debrief before I go too deep into a tangent. So I fly around, my hands get cold. I do a top landing, but also my legs are cold. I didn't dress appropriately for the day. My bad, you know, live and learn. But I expected it would be a little warmer. I had the kind of clothes on that I thought I needed. Much colder than what was predicted. Probably our elevation and the climbs had something to do with that. Yeah, I was unprepared for the weather. Yeah, elementary, man, elementary. I, I messed that up, but it didn't affect the flight. It didn't affect the safety too bad. But something did happen whenever I did my top landing and came down. It was a beautiful top landing. It was a little close to the back, actually. It's a tight, tight spot on Pano. If you don't thread the needle, you don't land there. You overshoot it or you get in the trees, and that's the only option you got. But I could see the cycle developing below me. I'd been flying in the thermal, busting off of there all day. So I was real tuned in to the weather conditions and what was happening, and I saw the lull, and I made an approach. And as I approached, it picked up, and I came off the brakes just to maintain my speed. I was right on the margin. Uh, you know, it's 
It's so tight of a margin. I've seen people go in trees there. But when I landed, it was a beautiful, soft, perfect landing, but my legs wouldn't work. They were so cold that I couldn't, I, just like my fingers wouldn't move, apparently my legs were kind of hemmed up too. And I got a little, little off balance and it seemed like I fall down all the time when I land in that big old pond harness thing's just gaudy. It's a dream to fly in, but it's kind of gaudy on the ground. It's a lot of weight. It's a lot of unbalanced weight. It wants to buck you off your feet. Just the weight of pulls you where you're hooked in down at your hips and where the weight of that harness is with the reserves and all your gear and your water behind you. It wants to flip you back and it's, it's always a struggle to keep your weight forward on that thing. It's just it is what it is, right? It is what it is but that's a race harness. So I, I couldn't turn around. I tried to turn around and my legs literally just wouldn't respond to the commands. And so I just sat down and I stalled the glider down. Instead of turning and kiting it, I was going off my feet. So I just uh, sat down and I stalled the glider and the glider scraped some pine trees on the way down. I need to inspect the top surface. I don't think anything happened. I didn't hear a bad sound, just a slight shh, but it wasn't a a catch and a tear and a snag. If it snags enough to tear a glider, generally it'll get hung on it at that point. It was nothing like that. Again, I was tight margins, real tight margins. So a perfect top landing, but a botched, you know, ground handling. I need to ground handle the thing. I've not done enough of that. I think that's that's all there is to it. I could ground handle so good in that in that lightweight pod though. I may switch back to that, but I'm glad I had the race harness today. It was real punchy. I was happy that I had the weight. I almost brought my old harness out, but I didn't. When I landed, this girl Bree was sitting on lawn. Or she, I said, did you see me land? She said, yeah. I said, I'm so cold, I can't, I can't feel the buckle. I couldn't, my fingers were numb like from the wrist down. So I couldn't feel the buckle on my helmet or, or I, I, the harness. I was just, it reminded me of those Navy SEALs making them get in the cold water and then tie knots and tie shoelaces or something. You just can't do it. You got like, meat bricks for ham for fingers and they don't cooperate they don't move you can't feel there's no sensory input that's what was going on and i was she said can i help you because I, I, I bought my glider up went over to the shade i was like i can't feel my buckles and she said can i help you i said you know i was half joking half serious let me and i tried to do it again and i could not undo the buckle on my helmet i just i couldn't see it couldn't feel it I was like, yeah, will you please unbuckle my helmet? <laughs> and she came over and did that for me. That, that was pretty nice. Thank you, Bree. First time I've ever had to ask anybody to do that. And the pain was intense in my hands for the blood coming back. They had been so numb for so long. I've, and, and 41 years, I've never, that was the most painful. That was the most, the worst. And it took five minutes. They, just as the blood poured into it, it felt like nails being driven into all my joints. It was a very painful. Yeah, I've had, you've had the tingly prickly, I have too, but this was worse. Like, this is worse than anything I'd ever experienced as far as reestablishing blood flow and the pain, <laughs> which I knew they weren't frozen. I knew they weren't frostbit. It wasn't that cold. I was above freezing. So I thought I would just let it go just to see what it was like. It was kind of a, an experiment in limits. What are your limits? What can happen? If your fingers go completely numb, your hands go numb while you're flying. I was able to maintain uh, pressure on the toggles. Rear riser control became almost an issue. I was able to look up and see. And if you can see, you can kind of coordinate you know, where your hands are. As far as feeling the, tog the wood toggles on the rear risers, or wood handles, I call them toggles, but the sticks, the sticks, yo. I couldn't feel the sticks, but if I looked and, and saw that I was touching them, I could get a grip on it and use use that to control my stuff. Yeah, that's it in a nutshell. Post-flight debrief. I think spring is right about this time. Yeah, something about the thermal quality. They were real punchy, real sharp edges. Pushing out from the lift to the sink at the, at the turbulent areas was very turbulent. On oh, the sides were particularly bad. Real buffety. I, I had to ma uh, maintain pressure in the glider on numerous occasions. I lost count. It was just like every time I exited a thermal halfway up, it was it was sharp and took big wax. There was enough wind that it was broken a little bit, but everything gathered nicely. And again, it's on a slope, so that makes it easier. But yeah, the thermals were, uh, they smoothed down as you got high, but you couldn't get real high. Just a, 
a couple thousand feet over the mountain was about the most that I got. I mean, I wasn't counting, but it looked like a couple grand over the top. It's good. I was above everybody a few times, so I know I was riding them to the top. Nobody was going any higher. But yeah, it's just uh, up and down, up and down. It was, it was fun. So not for beginner people, but it's perfectly doable if you know how to do it. And the Zeno's a handful, you know, that uh, glider selection, if I had just selected an easier glider to fly, I wouldn't have had to probably be on it as much. Fact. But that's the glider that I fly. So I enjoy, I enjoy challenging myself. It was also my first time back at the mountain this year, first day of the season. Uh, so my skills, you know, I've not thermaled a lot in a while and especially in that gear. I catch on pretty quick though, you know, it's like bike riding, you feel it once you know it. I can find the groove a lot quicker than Maybe I used to. After a few days, you know, I'm, I'm like that next level up. I was a little rough around the edges, you know, I was hitting some of the some of the edges. The Udi, the Udi messed up. The Udi would not attain satellite feed. I'm gonna send it to a guy and I'll make it right again. The main thing that I use the Udi for is wind direction. I didn't turn on a GPS. I wished I would have, and I'm gonna start doing that. Uh, even on the phone, like the little GPS app, just so I can see my ground speed. That will tell me what the winds are doing aloft as I climb. I can glance down and know where the headwind is. Uh, Udi actually has an arrow, so at an even quicker glance, you can look down and immediately know your wind direction at the altitude that you're at. And uh, it also shows you where the lift was previous to where you were at, like a thermal sniffer. You can glance down and in less than a second, I can attain enough data to know exactly where I need to go, how hard I need to push bar, what I'm looking for. All in under a second, it's like I look down and the answer is there. It's very convenient and, and not having that puts me back to kind of the, the you know, it's like putting blinders on again. You're using your skills, but you don't have that instant data, that instant answer to the equation. You've got to rely more on memory and headspace. So I just turned on some music in the Vario. That was my environment, was uh, just random tracks. I couldn't even change songs I didn't like. Like one would come on, I'd be like, eh. I wished I could skip it, but could feel my hands, wasn't gonna take a glove off. Had to stay on the controls because it was uh, rowdy conditions. Well, I just had to go with what I had. I wasn't about to get distracted around a bunch of people, low to the mountain on a nice spring day and get smashed in. That's how you get hurt. It was important to me to stay on the controls for the duration of the flight. I think that's about it. I think, I think I've covered all aspects of the flight. Sorry I had to do it going down the road holding this camera, but I need to make some time. So I know truck vlogs aren't the highest quality vlogs that you can get out there in the world, but it's what you get. <laughs> you know, just a an awkward thing that's never happened being as I've never been involved in a pandemic before now was uh, meeting new people on the mountain. Traditionally, in my culture, you meet somebody, you walk up to them and you say, hi, I'm Kylo. And they'll usually introduce themselves and you do a handshake and a make small talk. Where are you from? What you doing? What you flying? Looks good today. There were people that I already knew and being socially distant from them was fine. No harm, no foul. We all know what's going on. It's very awkward to try to meet new people at a distance. That's a skill that I've never practiced. Very strange stuff in the world that's going on. They've got the bathroom closed at this gas station. That's kind of sucky. Let me get some gas. So once again, I find myself without an outro for a video. Guess I was too tired to film it when I got home. Yeah, I do this in front of people. It gets awkward sometimes. This is it, guys. Video's over. They closed the mountain because of the whole virus outbreak stuff. I guess it'll be opened back up sometime this season. We'll see. Hope you enjoyed the video. Hope you learned something. What's up, guys? Kyle out.